Good morning. My name is Bill Yates and I'm the director of the Air National Guard Chaplain Corps. We welcome you to this exciting day of learning and reflection on the subject of moral injury. Our guest today is Dr. Ed Tick, a prolific author and recognized expert in the area of PTSD and moral injury. Dr. Tick, we're thrilled to have you with us today. Thank you so much, Chaplain Yates. I'm honored to be with you and to serve those who serve us. Thank you. Dr. Tick, I hope you'll allow me to begin with a quote from your book called Warrior's Return. Uh, this quote was especially helpful to me and took me right to the starting blocks in helping me understand what moral injury is and uh, what chaplains can start thinking about as they prepare to serve wounded warriors that may be suffering this condition. So I'm reading from page 55 in your book, Warrior's Return. A war veteran's psychology and spirituality is not a distorted or disordered version of civilian identity. It is a new identity itself. Dr. Tick, by saying that, your insight resonates with the work that we do as chaplains. Uh, it reminds us that there's more to PS PTSD than just perhaps the physical wounding of the body, uh, but there can be some deep-seated issues related to identity, and that can affect an individual's sense of meaning and purpose, and uh, uh, chaplains who provide spiritual care address those kinds of dynamics. So we're looking forward to learning from you today and finding ways that we can be better as chaplains to serve our veterans who've struggled with trauma and with moral injury. For our viewing audience today, you probably noticed the connection between uh, today's date and the content of today's presentation. Uh, on this 14th anniversary of 911, the first thing we want to do today is remember, honor, and give thanks for the men and women who have gone into battle, who have suffered the traumas of war, and who may even today struggle with some of the conditions that we're going to talk about. Yes. At the same time, we want to dedicate our energies today to learning more about PTSD and moral injury, so that as a chaplain corps, we can be better equipped uh, to serve and support the warrior, and to do so with compassion and understanding and care. To begin, I'd like to offer a prayer as we start our day off, uh, and I invite you in your own way to join me uh, as we offer a prayer at the beginning of our session. I start with a reading from the Hebrew Scripture. An anxious mind weighs a person down, but a heart at peace gives life to the body. Let us pray. God of all life, your watchful eye is upon us all, and your loving heart has compassion on all that you have made. We invite your presence today and blessing upon our day of learning, especially upon Dr. Tick. We also ask your blessing upon all veterans who carry the wounds of the soul and the traumas of war. Bring healing and hope, and bring renewed tranquility of mind and spirit that gives life to the flesh, that restores relationships, and that even reconciles our lives to those people and places, events and memories that have brought wounds to our souls. We ask you to hear us for the sake of all who suffer and for all who labor to alleviate suffering. Amen. Amen. We're very grateful to the TEC and the Warrior Network today for making this presentation possible. We're also grateful for all of you who have already acknowledged your participation in today's broadcast by sending an email. If you haven't done so, though, you'll notice at the bottom of the screen is an email address, and we invite all of you who are tuning in uh, to acknowledge that you are tuning in by sending an email to that uh, address at the bottom of your screen. We're ready to begin. Dr. Tick, thank you for being with us today. And thank you, Chaplain Yates, for the honor of being with you and serving you today and always. Our pleasure, thank you. Bless you. Well, good morning to all of you. Good morning, my friends and allies, my brothers and sisters in uniform, and any also joining us who are not in uniform. This material concerns us all, and we are all in utmost distress and concern on this anniversary of 9-11. We continue to be in distress and concern about all of our people, all of our troops serving overseas, 
serving domestically and the challenges that our troops, especially in this era of so few serving to protect so many. We are especially concerned with all of the burdens they carry. So we remember 9-11 as a national trauma that has affected us all. Every one of us saw the buildings hit by the airplanes. Every one of us has that image planted in our brains and that already is a beginning lesson for what trauma does. When the images penetrate us, the images of and the experience of violence in the world penetrating our psyche so it does not leave and those images and the feelings become frozen in us, we already understand what we call post-traumatic stress disorder and moral trauma. So today, together on this sacred day, we will examine together the dimensions of spirituality in warriorhood and in war wounding, and we will work together to empower our chaplains to bring spiritual care to our, all of our warriors, wounded and not wounded, and the new recruits. We are also concerned about reducing and preventing post-traumatic stress disorder and moral injury. And we will go to some very interesting places uh, and have lessons that you may not be familiar with yet, but we hope after today these traditions from the world warrior heritage will become yours to use for the benefit of ministering to all of our people. So this is a brief outline of our training day. It is a moral injury training day, but we will be covering much more than moral injury. As you see, I begin with a brief quote from the poet folk singer Leonard Cohen. A scheme is not a vision, and you never have been tested by the devil or the Lord. Well, whether you accept it literally or metaphorically, everyone in military service, and especially everyone who has ever been in a combat zone, has been tested by the devil and the Lord, the forces of evil, and the forces of good, as they manifest through human beings. Most importantly, I want to offer a vision, not a scheme. We have many, many, many schemes for fixing the problems incumbent upon military service, but we need a holistic vision that puts all of those schemes into a full understanding of military service, its blessings, its demands, its challenges, its wounds, and how we can tend the body, the mind, the heart, and spirit, the whole person with those wounds. So you see, we will first look at the spiritual dimensions of military service, moral injury and recovery, this first hour. Then we will look at the theory and practice of helping our veterans. We'll ask, what is moral injury? Does it differ from PTSD, and if so, how? And finally, we will focus on our chaplains and chaplain assistants and how they assist the healing process. And for those of you in the behavioral health fields and the medical fields, we welcome you as well, and we are all working together on the same wounds for the same benefit to our troops, veterans, and nation, and we wish to all collaborate in a more effective way in our treatment teams and strategies for all of our people. So first, we will look together at the spiritual dimensions of military service. Now, I certainly have worked with, I've been working with our veterans uh, since the end of the Vietnam War. I am older than I look, and I've been working with our uh, military and vets since uh, the late 1970s. The Vietnam War ended in 75. Post-traumatic stress disorder was only recognized as a diagnosis in 1980. And not having to serve, but looking for my form of national and alternative service, I became a therapist for our returning Vietnam veterans in the mid to late 1970s, before the diagnosis was even uh, created. And so I have spent these uh, almost 40 years on a profound mission to help our veterans and military uh, personnel, and perhaps uh, not more importantly, but on another level, I've been studying and practicing the world warrior tradition to find out what we are doing well, what we can do better, and since wars and warriorhood have been part of civilization for 
at least 5,000 years, there must be wisdom from other traditions in how to help support warriors through the hell of service and combat and how to bring them home effectively. So we will be looking at those traditions together. So we begin uh, with some invocations from our elders. Now this is the peace prayer of St. Francis. I'm sure most of you know it. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. I begin with this prayer because it is, not only because it is inspirational, but because it is the gift to us of two wounded warriors. For those who don't know, St. Francis himself was a wounded warrior. At about age 20, around the year 1200, a little thereafter, St. Francis, in rebellion against his parents' mercantile business and the dominant values, uh, middle-class values of his time, looking for the great adventure of his times, Francis went off to war. Uh, he spent a year in combat and was taken prisoner, spent another year as a POW on those very difficult early dark Middle Ages times where suffering was immense for the POWs. They, it always is, but especially under those conditions. Well, Francis came home after two years, and no surprise, he did not fit in. His parents still wanted him to join the business, don civilian clothing, come on home, it's over now. Well, Francis couldn't fit in, he didn't fit in, and just like today, with so many of our veterans not fitting in, he re-upped, went off for a second combat deployment, during that time, he had a profound spiritual breakdown, and we might say breakthrough. He went home, he donned his monk's robes, he went barefoot, and from then on, he served the wounded, the lepers, the homeless. He rebuilt old sanctuaries, and he confronted authority, both spiritual and civic authorities, to live up to their higher values. So Francis is a model of a wounded warrior who was transformed by his experience, came home and devoted himself to spiritual well-being of all people and all creation. However, Francis gave us many beautiful poems and prayers, but not the peace prayer. His peace prayer was actually written by an unknown soldier in the trenches of World War I. It was found by a chaplain in 1915, scribbled on the back of a St. Francis prayer card and stuck into a Bible that was found by that chaplain in the trenches. Our chaplain had the kindness and the vision to have the prayer translated into the language of every nation on both sides who were fighting World War I and distributed it to thousands and thousands of troops to give them spiritual support. So, peace and redemptive vision and love of all humanity and all creation can and in fact must emerge from the hellfires of war. Francis and our unknown soldier are magnificent models for this. And we continue to turn to our elders. We remember that George Washington, our first commander in chief and father of our nation, was the one who created the Army Chaplain Corps at the very beginning of the revolution. Washington kept a prayer journal. He wrote in every day. He actually prayed standing up. Uh, this picture is a bit romanticized, but we know that Washington stood and opened his arms and his heart to heaven as he prayed. Well, Washington formed the chaplain corps at the very beginning of the revolution, and in fact, the first chaplain was Reverend William Emerson, a Congregationalist minister who was on the bridge at Lexington with the Minutemen. So chaplains have been accompanying American warriors since the very beginning of our nation. And Washington said, the blessing and protection of heaven are at all times necessary, but especially so in times of public distress and danger. So the father of our nation declared at the beginning of our struggle to be a nation how deeply and desperately we need chaplains and we need spirituality to carry us through these profound and difficult challenges that are incumbent upon any and all wars. And we have another lesson from an elder. Uh, and this medicine chief of warriors, I learned this from one of my spiritual guides and teachers. This is a picture of Sitting Bull that I carry. It's on my desk at home and I brought it here. Sitting Bull is an elder here. He's actually wearing glasses, which happened at his, the end of his life. But I bring Sitting Bull for several reasons. 
Sitting Bull, as we all know, was a great warrior in chief. Well, he said that was neither of those roles were the most important roles he played, but rather the single most important role he played for his people, he said, was as medicine chief of the Hunkpapa Warrior Society. As medicine chief of warriors, he was responsible for the spiritual health and well-being of all of his warriors, including, after they were wounded, restoring their spirits, restoring their souls. In the Lakota language, what we call PTSD is called Nahinapeapi, which means the spirits left him, the spirits left him. They understood the traumatic wound to be primarily spiritual and the task of, of medicine chiefs, the task of their chaplains was to bring back the spirit that left their warriors on the battlefield as a result of combat trauma. So Sitting Bull also teaches us to be medicine chiefs of warriors and he says, and George Washington said, that if our warriors are well, our nation will be well. If our warriors fall, it will infect the entire nation and we will all be weaker for it. Not only in protection, but in the spiritual health and well-being that unites us as one people. And we continue together to look at some of the lessons from our elders that set the tone for understanding the spiritual dimensions of military service and war. This quote comes from the Bible that was given to all of our troops during World War II. And I do carry my father's World War II Bible. He was an MP at the very end of the war. He carried the Bible through his service and uh, he passed it on to me. Blessedly, he's still alive and with us. And I'll share with you briefly that like most World War II era veterans, he was uh, very hardworking and very silent. But ever since I've been working with our military, and especially since I've served on Fort Knox, where he was stationed for part of his tour, uh, it was like an electrode was planted in, my, in his brain, and his stories have been pouring out. And in his old age and infirmity, we've been closer than ever. So we have transgenerational wounding, had a missing father for much of my life in those emotional and spiritual ways, and we have transgenerational healing through embracing the warrior tradition. Well, at the very end of the Bible, uh, after sacred text, uh, Chaplain Arnold, who was Army Chief of Chaplains during World War II, had these, made this statement. A soldier who knows the word of God and honestly tries to observe his laws is a man of power and influence among his fellows. He exalts his military service to the high level of religious faith, courage, and loyalty. A very important statement that we will return to in a few moments. How do we exalt our service today? And to another one of our elders, and especially for our Air Force, General Mosley was Chief of Staff of the Air Force uh, recently, and you probably all know that he wrote the Airman's Creed and it was introduced into the Air Force in 2007, and you all know it, you all carry it. Most of you, not all of you, recite it, and we can talk about that later. However, the importance of a warrior's creed cannot be underestimated, and every warrior tradition in the world knows had a creed, even those warriors that we may not respect or honor, like the Nazi SS had their creed, the Taliban have their creed, and the creed is meant to guide the warrior with a foundational ethos so that he or she will have the strength to pass through service and, as General Mosley said, will not fail. And so, briefly, we visited with a few of our elders and teachers, and let's look at the lessons they pass on to us about the spiritual dimensions of warriorhood. From General Washington, we need spirituality and we must protect our troops' souls. In fact, at the end of the revolution, Washington said to some of his troops who had been through the entire war with him and were ragged in soul as well as body, he said, I think you need to go live in the woods away from civilization. You are no longer fit for civilization and the people will not understand. So we utterly need spirituality. We don't want to banish our troops to the woods. We do know that there are enclaves of veterans living 
in the woods all over our nation in very remote places and veterans who have gone in exile and living abroad. We don't want that. We want all of our warriors to come home. We need spirituality. We need to tend the warrior's deep spirit and soul to bring them home. From St. Francis, we learn, and the unknown soldier, we learn that a, a redemptive vision must emerge for us to follow and serve. Service is demanding, combat is hell. We remember General Sherman told us war is hell. Every veteran who is in the combat zone, no matter how deeply on the front lines, as a, a foot soldier or over the air, above the fighting, but participating in, in it from the air, everyone is in a version of hell, of the underworld, and every soul must come back from that hell. Realizing hell too was created by divinity, hell, a version of hell, appears in the, every mythology of the world, and so we have to conceive of our returning troops and veterans as people who have survived their time in hell and need spirituality in order to return and be restored. From Sitting Bull, we understand we need priests of warriors, and he invites us to be the medicine chief of warriors. We might say Sitting Bull was the chief chaplain of the Hung Papa warriors, uh, if we translate our terminology into theirs. But be a priest of warriors, keep them on a spiritual path, and help them find restorative service. From Chaplain Arnold, we have the, in, the invitation, the demand that we exalt our service and General Mosley, of course, reminds us to be guardians of freedom and justice. But let us remember the reason he created the creed was that he wished to reinvigorate the warrior ethos into the Air Force. So we must reinvigorate that warrior ethos and understand the warrior spirit is something built into all of us. It's a universal human trait that we all seek to develop together especially in our people who serve. So we move on after those invocations and beginning lessons to ask about war and the soul. And uh, for those of you who know my books, thank you very much. And I hope and pray they've given great contribution to you. And for those who don't, I do want to re uh, recommend, suggest my earlier book, War and the Soul, Healing Our Nation's Veterans from Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder. In this book, I did talk about moral injury, moral trauma, a decade ago, and it is very good that many of us have worked together to bring the understanding of moral trauma forward as a key concern, and we'll get into it deeply today. I also talk about soul loss, how the soul is affected by war, and the impact of service during war and especially in the combat zone on the soul. Uh, we can also call PTSD post-traumatic soul distress. Soul distress, not just stress disorder, thinking about the brain and the heart and the nervous system, but soul distress afflicting our entire being. I do want to recommend uh, when you read War in the Soul, whether chaplains, of course, feel comfortable talking about soul and spirit. I, I am a psychotherapist. I am an interfaith minister as well, but um, I'm primarily trained and known as a psychotherapist, and I do use soul talk. And the very first story I tell in War in the Soul is of a Vietnam veteran from Khe San who had no religious training or experience and was a simple man, but in our very first session, he described his soul loss during the siege of Quezon. And uh, from that time on, and this was early on in my career, in about uh, hmm, late 1980s that I worked with this man and veterans started talking about their souls and using that word. And I find that from then on, I speak soul talk with our vets, and they can relate to that very easily, very well, and they say, yes, yes, that's what happened to me, that's what I need to talk about. Sometimes, um, I'm honored to hear this, some of our veterans carry my book into their therapists and say, to work with me, please read this book, 
and let's work with the soul. So what do we mean by the soul and what do we mean by holism? Uh, we are all concerned, chaplains, medical people, behavioral health people, we are all concerned with moving toward more holistic practice. So today we do have the practice of body-mind medicine and very many healers and practitioners talk about healing body, mind, and spirit. These are good. These are advances over where we have been in previous decades. However, something's missing. What is missing? Well, in body, mind, spirit, we're missing the heart. We are body, mind, heart, and soul, not body, mind, spirit. So we have to make space for the heart. We'll talk later about how PTSD was once conceived of as a heart wound rather than a psychological wound. We have to include the emotional life of human beings in our understanding of holism and the impact of service and war. But that's not even enough, because body, mind, heart, and spirit were still isolated people. We live in community. We are social creatures. So it's body, mind, heart, and soul in community. And we have to look at the way our community responds to our troops and the way our community sends our troops or doesn't, and the way our communities take responsibility for well welcoming home and reintegrating our troops. We'll talk about this later as well, but so many of our troops say, my trauma didn't happen in the combat zone, my trauma happened upon homecoming by the way I was treated or mistreated or neglectfully treated by the care providers and by the community and by the nation. And yet even that isn't enough. Body, mind, heart, and soul in community without meaning falls short. We must have transcendent meaning. Everyone is looking for a purpose-driven life. Many people suffer because they don't feel that way about their lives. And in, uh, after, in military service and after, any time we have seen pain, suffering, affliction, it is most important that we seek transcendent meaning and purpose in our actions, in our experiences, and create meaning afterwards. We know that so many of our troops in Vietnam and also tragically in Iraq and Afghanistan, so many of our troops use the adage, it don't mean nothing. Well, that's heartbreaking, that's soul wounding. It must mean something when we are willing to risk our lives, when we sacrifice our lives, when our comrades sacrifice our lives, when we are exposed to and participate in so much death and destruction, it has to have transcendent meaning. And if we don't experience the meaning during service, then we have to restore meaning afterwards. So we are especially concerned with our Air Force, and I thank and bless all of you Air Force chaplains and personnel for your work, for your service, and for using me and honoring me to help serve you. We are looking at the warrior. Now, I want us to know there are many, many images of the warrior throughout history that we can look at. Every image of the warrior, including our modern American images, is a localized and temporal expression of the warrior archetype. Warrior is one of our foundational archetypes. It's built into us. It's built into our psyches. We have world history of images, of stories, of patterns that occur again and again with warriors and through warriorhood. And the depth psychologists, the Jungians and Neo-Jungians, do declare that warriorhood is built into everyone's psyche, men and women, and must unfold. So we all have an inner warrior to develop, and military service throughout the ages has been used to develop that inner warrior archetype to bring strength, courage, resilience, devotion, sacrifice for the greater good, protection and preservation of what is most sacred to the people. Strategy, force as necessary, not abusive force, but strength to guard our borders and protect our people and serve our people through the life cycle. I chose this picture for our warrior archetype for all of you in the Air Force uh, whom we serve and honor today. This is a rendition of the Greek hero Perseus, 
riding the winged stallion Pegasus. So please know that even be long before airplanes were invented, long before we had a modern air force, there were sky warriors. And we can look back in mythology for their, them, to them as role models, and we can read their stories to understand the warrior's journey. So Perseus on Pegasus was a sky warrior. He might have been called uh, the air force of ancient Greek mythology. So please know the warrior is uh, universal. It has a unique spirituality, and we will move forward to explore that. Now, to chaplains especially, I know you are profoundly well-trained and prepared in your den denomination of origin to be magnificent, loving, tending ministers. And I also know that for all of our branches, chaplain training is deep and wide and profound and gives all of the, not just the rules and regs, but the inspiration and the spirituality behind chaplaincy. Well, chaplain training is necessary. Religious training, of course, is necessary. And I want to suggest, uh, strongly suggest, and urge you to consider that there is a unique warrior spirituality that has been developed through the ages that abides in civilization and in us and that we must study and practice and add to our tools for tending our warriors. And we will focus on that for a few moments. So warrior spirituality and warriorhood. As we say, warriorhood is a lifelong identity. Once a warrior, always a warrior. It's true not just about the Marines, once a Marine, always a Marine. They say that proudly and we honor them for being Marines forever. But the larger identity, the universal identity is a warrior. And once somebody is on that path, uh, they are on it uh, for life. And we do make a terrible mistake in our society by not continuing to nurture the lifelong warrior identity, but rather expect our troops, after they become veterans, to fit in as civilians again and narrow down their experience and their focus into a civilian identity. So much of disability rating, when somebody perhaps receives a 50% uh, dis psychological disability rating, we're telling them and telling our, ourselves and our nation, this person is, can perform as 50% of a civilian and he or she is half broken. We don't want that, we want to declare that changed, transformed identities come out of the experience of military service, and it is our responsibility, our blessing, and our challenge to continue to nurture that identity through the entire life cycle. So we are looking again with the warrior spirituality. Let us look for a few minutes at how war is a sacred arena. We have a picture of the Apache War Chief Geronimo here who said, from the moment the command for war is given, everything assumes a religious guise, everything. We suffer in our country because only a few of us are at war and 99 and a half percent of the country is not at war, acts as if life goes on as usual, Unfortunately, in our elections, past and present, we hardly even discuss the wars, but a few of us are at war all the time. Now, in the Apache world and in traditional worlds, what Geronimo said was true. We are in a sacred arena. The Apaches had a separate language that they used, that everybody spoke when they were in, at war. The language was a sacred language only reserved for times of war so that everybody was constantly reminded. We are challenged, we must be united in this, and we are in sacred space. The giving and taking of life, the demands of warrior service is inherently sacred. And let us look at the ways it is. So again, we declare and we understand that war is a sacred arena. And here are some of the ways that we understand it to be sacred. In wartime, everything is ultimate. 
Every step you take can be your last. Every meal could be the last. We are fighting for our lives, for the lives of our comrades. Every second is eternal and is of the utmost intensity. The World War II correspondent Ernie Pyle said, war makes strange giant creatures out of us little routine men who inhabit the planet. So we are made giant. We are filled with universal and cosmic forces. We see the birth and the death of worlds. We see divine energy of creation in the powers that we unleash. Everything is ultimate. And war and becoming a warrior and going through co the combat zone is a death rebirth initiation. It has always been thought and said that war brings forth the man. And this is for better and for worse. The best of us, the best of humanity, the worst of humanity comes out in the war zone and we are changed we, and we do experience a psycho-spiritual death and we must experience a rebirth. And in fact, becoming a warrior is meant to be an initiation and a rebirth into the new identity. We've said as well that war is a descent into the psycho-spiritual underworld. General Sherman not only said war is hell, he also said war is war. It is a hideous condition of its own and we cannot change its nature. And he also did say, war is cruelty and you cannot refine it. After the war, Sherman traveled the country making war is hell speeches, urging people to restrain from war. Then of course he became an Indian fighter and went back to war. That's another part of the story. But from his wisdom, war is cruelty. We cannot refine it and we should not disguise it. We must tell the truth to our people, to our troops, to ourselves about the profound de death and destruction and cruelty that happens in war and our challenge to recover and return from. Another sacred dimension, battle's essence is to kill or be killed. Homer said of the Trojan War 3,500 years ago, to meet destruction or to come through, these are the terms of war. And everybody is reduced to that moment of working for the, their own and their comrades' survival. We are not thinking of the big political issues of the day. We are thinking about killing or being killed, meeting destruction or coming through. It is the essence. And once a person has been in that situation, again, whether on the ground or flying over, overhead, we are always in danger of losing our lives or if we are distant fighters of losing our or wounding our hearts and souls, even if our lives are not in direct danger. So how do we come through? What damage happened to us and what to others? Another aspect of the sacred dimension of war is that killing another is the most painful human act. Brian Turner was a poet before he went to the Iraq War. I highly recommend his book, Here, Bullet, to all of you. He gave profound poetic expression to all the dimensions of war service. And he said in one of his poems, no matter what, no matter what adrenaline is rushing through your veins, no matter what muscles are contracting, no matter what the foe has done to you, no matter what, it should break your heart to kill. And we do know from important studies of war, destructiveness, uh, Colonel Grossman's books on killing, on combat, killing another human being is the most painful and traumatic human act. And when we have to do that, we will be traumatized as well. And we need to heal our hearts and souls from that act, even when we judge it to have been necessary and righteous. More of the sacred dimensions, the sacred arena of war. During war and in military service, we become agents of death and destruction. Inevitably, the purpose of war and warriorhood is to fight and kill if necessary, and we do study and practice the killing arts. We, this is no negative judgment, it is just true that we become agents of destruction and death, and we immerse in those energies and those arts. And we are in an essentially moral arena. When we are 
dealing destruction and death to others when they are dealing it to us. We are encountering the forces of good and evil as created by human beings. Not only are we in this arena, not only are we encountering gargantuan forces of good and evil that come through us but are much bigger than us, but we are given the power over life and death. And these powers traditionally are reserved for the divine, not for us. Karl Malnentes wrote a fine book. Uh, you may know his novel Matterhorn about his Vietnam experience. And then following that, he wrote, What Is It Like to Go to War? I highly recommend that book as well. And in that book, he said about himself as a combat Marine, about all of us, when we ask young warriors to take on God's role of taking life without adequate psychological and spiritual preparation, we are creating a recipe for post-traumatic stress disorder and moral breakdown. We do ask this of our warriors. We must give them profound psychological and spiritual preparation, not just in how to behave as warriors, how to practice the arts of warriorhood, the killing arts, but what does it do to us? How does it feel? How can we take care of ourselves before, during, and afterwards? What is our responsibility to the dead, to our own, and to the others? Critical questions, critical preparation that our chaplains could uh, be uh, profoundly helpful and in charge of shaping in the training and preparation of our troops. So ultimately, we must develop an enlarged spiritual vision, a vision that can carry the experience with meaning and an identity that can carry the conditions. And I offer you a quote from a Russian Jewish battlefield medic and surgeon from World War I, Saul Chernikovsky. In one of his poems, he said, in the fire that summons fire, offering misery and persecution, you, my God, were in them. Your glory overwhelmed me. Chernikovsky saw God in the light going out in the eyes of a dying soldier. He saw God's power in the bombs that fell around him as he operated in the trenches in his muddy hole of an operating room. He saw divine powers at work. He humbled himself before them and prayed as he operated. And he taught us all that the cosmic powers are unleashed during warfare and we are their servants. We are, can be their victims. We, and they are going to reshape us forever with that exposure to the cosmos. And when we come home, we will be blasted open with vision. And we have to find ways to fit that vision into our lives, carry it through life, and fit it into our shared common world. So, understanding war as a sacred arena, let's reflect for a moment on some of the dimensions of warrior spirituality. Warrior spirituality is universal. It is not dependent on a particular religion. It's not dependent on a national tradition. Of course, we have an American warrior heritage that stretches back to the beginnings of this continent. Of course, our Native American brothers and sisters have a warrior heritage that runs through their societies and stretches back for thousands of years. But even more than that, warrior spirituality is universal. There is the archetype in all of us that needs to be nurtured and developed, again, whether we are in the military or not. The military is and should be responsible and wise, circumspect in how it develops and nurtures the warrior archetype in all of our people who serve. And many people who do not serve continue to look for the development and the unfolding of their warrior archetype in their civilian life. And actually, military-civilian partnerships can help both sides in that development. Warrior spirituality also occurs in ultimate existential and moral dimensions. It is ultimate in that we are exposed to the raw powers of the universe as they've been put into human hands. It is existential in that we are creating ourselves every single moment. The French philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre, famous existentialist, 
said that he and France were never as free as when they were in Nazi occupation and trying to resist and free their country. He meant that on those front lines, every single minute we are creating our reality, every single minute we are determining our personal history and the history of humanity. And those existential demands are extreme and severe in the military and in the combat zone. And of course, we are in ultimately in moral dimensions too. We are exposed to good and evil, to the great and the small. We experience ourselves as having powers beyond the ordinary, and we know that we can do good, we can do ill, and we learn how fragile and precious life is, how easily it is destroyed, and how much work and labor it takes to restore life, whether it's psychological life, spiritual life, or repairing the physical damage. All of these dimensions are aspects of warrior spirituality. Warrior spirituality also engages our soul, our self, our essence. It is the most intense experience that most people ever have. So we know, by now it's an adage, uh, no, I don't want to come go shopping with you at the mall. I want to hang out with my veteran brothers and sisters. Uh, we have become so, and St. Francis could not stay home. He had to go off for another combat deployment. We seek to be in the zone, and we know what we call the adrenaline high remains. People are looking for energy, for intensity, to, for excitement, and hopefully to attach that to meaning and purpose, but they will seek that energy if they cannot find it in civilian life. So, warrior, warrior spirituality awakens and energizes the warrior archetype, and we must find ways after service, both within the military and in our veteran status, to keep that warrior archetype energized and strong. Many of our veterans find meaningful forms of ongoing service, but we also know many have troubles, get into trouble because the warrior archetype does not know what to do or how to address itself. And so we have all of so many of the social problems that come uh, upon veterans in part because there's a lost warrior in them and they don't know what to attach it to. And so high speed driving, bar fights, use of drugs and alcohol, um, criminal behavior, all kinds of negative social conditions result from the warrior archetype having been awakened and then being told to just go home, mow your lawn, go shopping, and be content. Not possible. We have to find higher meaning and purpose and keep that lifelong warriorhood going through the life cycle. And as we've said, war is inherently moral and spiritual, and it is all-inclusive. So we are not talking about a particular religious tradition, though many traditions have specific lessons about warriorhood, and we will look at some of those as we go through today. But rather, we are, regardless of one's belief in divinity or particular religious alignment, we are an inherently moral and spiritual and an all-inclusive realm with warrior spirituality. And therefore, it does represent the integration of psychology, spirituality and community. We need psychology to understand how we've been taken apart and help us put ourselves back together. We need spirituality to energize and direct us to make sense of that sacred arena of heaven and hell that we've passed through we, and to deal with difficult issues of shame and guilt and other matters that psychology tends to have uh, light fingers uh, regarding exploring and touching, and it plunges us properly into our relations with the community, those who haven't served, and even those with whom we have uh, fought. And so it, when we embrace warrior spirituality, we are including psychology, spirituality, cross-cultural studies, global concerns for understanding and for unification. And so Working with our warriors, we need all of the disciplines to be in partnership, working together for the warrior's body, 
mind, heart, and soul, and helping awaken the communities and reintegrate communities and warriors, not make warriors civilians again, but rather help them have an ongoing warrior identity recognized, supported, and tended by the community. All of our disciplines come together in partnership to address warrior spirituality and to help bring our warriors home through integration, respect, teamwork between all of the disciplines. And so we are looking at war and the soul, war's impact on the soul. We'll talk more specifically about some of the wounds to the mind, the heart, and the soul as we go through today. But for now, we are making a kind of summative statement that as we contemplate the impact on the soul, we understand that military service and combat, no matter how we participate in it, transform everything about us. Of course, we understand and we've had much research in recent years about brain chemistry, the impact on the brain and the central nervous system of uh, functioning in the war zone and in the military. So the brain, chem brain chemistry, our nervous system functioning, and stress exposure are certainly part of the inheritance of having been in the combat zone. But beyond that, we have the body, the mind, the heart, the soul, all transformed by their time in the combat zone. We have personal and community relationships, all different. We practice intimacy differently as a result of being in the military. We are part of the brotherhood and sisterhood, and that is often the strongest relationship people have, and it often trumps even family, blood family and marital family relationships and can cause challenges at home. So we have to see how personal relationships are changed and also community relationships. We have a terrible, terrible, tragic alienation between warriors and civilians in our society and we are all challenged to overcome that alienation and create new and lasting partnerships between warriors and civilians. The warriors served and protected us Civilians are responsible to tend and protect the warriors upon homecoming. We'll look at that more closely later on as well, but we can translate PTSD not only as soul distress, but also post-traumatic social disorder. The break between our warrior and civilian populations is a social disorder, and we will talk about how to address that later on. Our philosophy and our moral structures change as a result of service and combat as well. We have to consider how our philosophy, our guiding philosophy of life, and how our morality has changed, and we need support to examine that, and to, as one chaplain said, to renegotiate our covenant with the divine once we have been in the combat zone and participated in the massive transformations and changes through death and destruction and also through brother and sisterhood that happen there. Our identity changes and as Chaplain Yates began saying, what we need to understand and what our young veterans especially are asking us to understand. They're saying, don't diagnose me. I'm not broken. I'm not ill. I'm different. I'm different. One of the veterans I work with at home says, uh, he was in the first Gulf War and he said, well most of you, you civilians are round shaped and after being in the Navy and in the Gulf War, I came out an oval. Can the round people accept the oval people? Can the oval accept the round and understand we have different identities, all of which are valid, all of which need to be supported through the life cycle. We also have transformed places in history and in culture. We join the, the American and the world legacy of warriorhood and we need to take our place there. We need to understand our place in history and the small part we have played in the, on that great stage of historical evolution and change. And we need to decide how we judge ourselves for that and how we judge our time and whether we've contributed to a positive evolution of our nation and of world history. 
And even more than that, we have touched the cosmic dimensions. Uh, I refer, we all refer to the book of Job. It is one of the, perhaps, a, uh, certainly one of the most important spiritual documents that we have ha had from world, uh, world spiritual literature. The GI is like Job, having seen and experienced the losses of everything, the destruction of the world, but living through it, and we need, like Job, human comfort does not usually help. The comforters fail us for many reasons that we'll look at later, and so we need to turn to the cosmos, to the divine, to our spiritual paths, even if we're atheists or humanists. We need to turn to what is highest and what we count as most important to recreate our place in the cosmos to, and to reawaken and rebirth a sense of meaning and purpose. Our relationship with love and with death, those two foundational forces in the universe that spiritual lessons and mythology have taught us are at the base of all things. Freud said the um, Eros and Thanatos, the love drive and the death drive are the two great forces of life that are always at war in us. Our relations to love and to death have changed and we need to understand clearly what they've become. We need to see how they've changed us and how we love and even how we make love because that changes as well. And we need to embrace and grow these changes and facilitate uh, positive changes and growth producing changes in all of these arenas. And finally, our relations to the divine as well. We all have heard the adage, There's no, there are no atheists in the foxhole. Well, I honor some World War II veterans who confronted me when I quoted that in a workshop I led for them. Three World War II veterans present were concentration camp liberators. And they made fun in a loving way of my youth and my naivete, and they said, yeah, Dr. Tick, well, for us, for we who have viewed human evil in the concentration camps and seen what evil does, sometimes the foxhole creates atheists. And for these three men, that's what happened. They lost all their faith uh, in World War II and witnessing the concentration camps. This is just one example of how our relationships to the, the divine can change and do change. And again, I re uh, quote again one of our chaplains, we must help our troops renegotiate their covenant with the divine as a result of passing through military service and the combat zone. And we affirm together that all of our transformational efforts must address all of these. Some of our medical professionals address some of these dimensions our psychological health, mental health professionals address some. Our chaplains, as we see, are inherently prepared and trained and sensitive to the religious and spiritual dimensions. And they, you, are quite capable and gifted in addressing these dimensions and bringing these kinds of therapeutic and healing conversations to our troops and veterans and into our treatment teams along with our other practitioners. So we do care for our troops on every level, body, mind, heart, soul, with transcendent meaning and in community. We can do this, we can make this happen, and you are all profoundly prepared and gifted to do so. So thank you very much, and this con concludes my first hour of presenting. But uh, many of you have sent in questions uh, for us to discuss. And so after each of my presentations, we will have a panel discussion. And I'm honored to be accompanied by our Air Force chaplains who have created and are hosting this event and gifting it to all of you so we can all serve better. So welcome, chaplains, and thank you very much. And let's go to our panel. All right, thank you again, Dr. Tick. Uh, you are a deep well, and your insights are a blessing to us as you help us understand not only warrior spirituality, but the impact of war on the human soul. So we're so grateful that uh, you've done this research, and we're now the beneficiaries of, of the hard labor that uh, you've given to this subject. Uh, thank you. I want to introduce to you uh, Chief Master Sergeant Kathy Utrecht. She is our Chaplain Assistant Career Field Functional Manager for the Air National Guard Chaplain Corps. Chief Utrecht. Well, thank you, sir. 
It's, it's my honor to be here with uh, Dr. Tick today and uh, have the opportunity to ask a few questions of him. So thank you. And that's what we're doing now. Uh, this is our first panel in which we've solicited questions from the field. And Dr. Tick has been gracious to give us answer to many of the questions that you may have uh, as you view the presentations today. So let's get started. And I'm going to ask the first question, Dr. Tick. We have seen data on the estimated number of combat vets suffering PTSD and traumatic brain injury. Is there similar research on the number of veterans suffering moral injury? Of course, this is an important question, and since moral injury is a relatively new concept in the behavioral health field, and still somewhat controversial amongst many people, there is not a lot of empirical data yet. Uh, there are some studies that have translated moral injury into uh, psychologically, psycholo excuse me, psychological research terminology, but it's still very new, and we don't have uh, statistics and numbers. So rather, we have to talk from experience and what we call anecdotal. Now, first, we should be aware, and probably we all are, of the extent of post-traumatic stress disorder. The most accurate numbers we have today seem to, uh, to indicate that about 20% of active duty forces from all branches and 40% of reservists and guard members, from, again, from all branches, suffer post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, medical research has said now that nearly 100%, at least of the troops on the ground, will have some degree of TBI because of the degree to which explosives from both sides have become the normative weapon. So the numbers for PTSD and TBI are astronomical. And let us also remember that the data is always lower than the actual figures. OK, so this being said, uh, moral injury is of a different dimension. We are saying it is of the mind, the heart, the soul. And uh, we don't have instruments that measure the human heart and the human soul. And we should affirm that there are some things that are beyond statistics. And we do work together, uh, chaplains and psychologists and medical doctors, to tend the human spirit as well as the human heart. And we should not uh, assume that if we can't measure everything, that it's not there, but rather listen to our veterans' testimony. Uh, in the mental health field and psychological research, we used to have the time-honored practice of case study the case study method. We can look at one human being, see that human being's psychological and spiritual history, and generalize from that to all of us. Uh, unfortunately, in our modern era, the case study method has um, been considered less important. And when one presents a case study, uh, another uh, mental health professional may say, well, that's just anecdotal, rather than that is a profound and deep human story that we can all learn from. So I'm also calling for a return of the case study method, looking closely at our individuals. And as a therapist for these 40 years, uh, of course, that's what I do. And we do need to restore the, the non-empirical as valid as well. So when we listen to the testimony of our veterans and our troops, and when we listen to the world history of testimony, we hear that moral injury is always present, that we cannot participate in the dealing of destruction and death without moral consequences. And in my 40 years of work with our troops and veterans, I really, I've been struggling with this ever since we planned this event. I've been trying to think of a case that I worked with where someone suffered PTSD and said, but I do not have moral injury. It's just my uh, breakdown from stress. Now, many troops can come out of the combat zone having expected to be a warrior and saying, this is what warriors do. And I didn't experience moral injury because I was in a fair fight with an armed foe. So the moral injury doesn't necessarily happen overseas or in the combat zone. But these same troops report 
my injury became at home. My injury was on homecoming from neglect or betrayal or an inability to get services upon homecoming. And the moral injury was that my country that I loved and served and was willing to give my life for did not return that kind of tending to me. So I would say that moral injury, the moral dimension is universal in warrior spirituality. And we always have to look for moral injury uh, as at the core of the post-traumatic stress disorder wound. Thank you so much. This is the second question that comes from the field. Some people refer to World War II as a good or moral war and describe the Iraqi war as a bad or immoral war. The purpose of this question is not to debate these two wars, but rather to ask about the occurrence of moral injury in warriors, whether it results from so-called good, moral, or bad, immoral wars. Now this is a very important question and we do tend to believe that if it was a good war that people will come out more, more clean. So I continue to work with World War II veterans. Now they're, you know, I don't know if any are left in their 80s. They're in their 80, late 80s, their 90s. And these World War II veterans continue to squeeze out their stories of moral injury at the, uh, at the end of life. The closer they get to the end, uh, the more they are concerned about their eternal life if they're religious or what the fate of their soul. And many say they want to make peace with their maker before they die. So I've sat with uh, World War II veterans in their 80s and 90s who were confessing moral injuries for the first time. And one, since we are working together in the Air Force, I'll briefly mention the story of a man who only asked for help in his late 80s. So 70 years after his service, he shared that he was a World War II bombardier at age 18. And he shared how he vomited his guts out the first time he had to open his bomb bay doors. And he knew he was uh, killing hum uh, uh, civilians down uh, uh, in the European cities as well as enemy combatants. And he said, I have felt like a mass murderer my whole life. Everybody reassured me it was the good war. And I had to do it, it was necessary. And even if I accept that and believe that, I still did it. I was the murderer. Mm -hmm. And he was, had been unable to forgive himself. He wanted to make peace with it before he met his maker. So it is so that moral injury is inevitable in all wars. Uh, I lead healing journeys to Vietnam every year. Uh, the Vietnamese do not have post-traumatic stress disorder. We'll talk about that later, um, but uh, they really don't. However, they do testify, uh, in the words of one Viet Cong veteran that we meet with, war makes everyone crazy. But they committed atrocities as well. They suffered moral injury, even if they didn't suffer post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and uh, as St. Augustine reminded us, to kill another human being, we must harm ourselves. The sword passes through us to pass into another. So PTSD can be mitigated by truly righteous and purely defensive wars. And some traditions teach us, as in Vietnam, one reason they don't have PTSD is because they were only defending their country. They weren't aggressors, even though they could be vicious and commit atrocities. And among the Navajo people, they had defender warriors and aggressor warriors. And the defenders who stayed home near the villages did not develop the traumatic wound. Only the aggressors who went out to attack other villages and steal their horses and children developed the wound. So. Moral injury goes with war inevitably, but it can and will be mitigated by being purely defensive, purely righteous, and profoundly careful about how we use force. Chief? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, my first question uh, is regarding uh, folks nowadays say that they're spiritual rather than religious. Yes. And we call these people none. Uh, Not N U N. No, no, N O N E. And so, my question is for chaplains and chaplain assistants out there who may feel leery uh, of or are having a difficult time um, helping those folks that are out in the field that might be leery of organized religion. 
um, and they desire that spiritual dimension, how would you recommend that our chaplains and chaplain assistants help these folks? Well, as we're saying together, military service and war occur in inherently spiritual arenas. So we can and we are right in differentiating religion and spirituality. Religion carries spirituality, but people, many people today declare they are trying to live spiritual lives on a spiritual path without the support of the, the religion or in rebellion against their religion of origin for whatever uh, the multitude of reasons they found it um, inadequate for their needs. So let us affirm and let our chaplains affirm that military service and warriorhood are inherently spiritual. And that if we, when we have to serve in a war zone, we are inevitably in a moral arena and a sacred arena. And that means we are in liminal space. We are in a transformed consciousness and a transformed environment. And we're moving through sacred space that partakes of what we understand to be both heaven and hell. Now, those who are walk, walking a spiritual path and who may not be religious, including, and like I would say especially our atheists and humanists, are on a highly moral and spiritual path. And it can be even more difficult for them to walk their spiritual path because if they do not believe in a deity, but if they are atheists or existentialists and they say, we create ourselves, we are responsible for every act we take and we define ourselves and create ourselves as we move through the universe. This is actually a very demanding and difficult and highly spiritual task. So we can learn lessons from all religions without demanding that they believe the religious tenets, without professing religious belief, but we can draw the spiritual lessons from our religions and offer them and affirm together that our nuns are in fact on moral and spiritual journeys and they are perhaps a-religious or non-theistic, but it's still a profoundly demanding moral journey. And let's give them perhaps even more support for trying to walk it without their uh, professed belief in a divinity. Thank you, sir. Uh, following up on that, uh, on that question, in today's increasing postmodern uh, culture where warriors believe that in no deity or have no real beliefs, um, no moral absolutes, how do, how do you think that um, the warrior turns, who does it turn to for that moral support or that moral authority to receive absolution? Well, we affirm that absolution is necessary and again, even if someone uh, does not have a uh, belief in a divinity or a spiritual presence in the universe, we still need to seek absolution, forgiveness, redemption from being involved in uh, the activities of hell. And chaplains still would be the proper person to turn to as long as the chaplain is not trying to proselytize or convert, but rather when, as our chaplains, as you chaplains, experience yourselves to be traveling companions to our warriors and we are on a moral journey together, then it is not necessarily that we have to turn to God, but rather, again, if we only believe in human beings, uh, we have to turn to each other, to ourselves and to each other for goodness, for acceptance, for forgiveness and for understanding. And so the chaplain and the nun must become moral authorities together, deciding what their moral absolutes are in a universe they may say is empty of other authority. And that means we must deeply understand and empathize with each other and seek that forgiveness and that release from, the, from chaplain perhaps first from fellows and eventually from the human community. Thank you, Dr. Tech. Thank you very much. One brief uh, reminder for those of you who are watching. Uh, if you have not yet acknowledged by email your participation in today's presentation, we just simply ask that you send an email to the address at the bottom of your screen. Thank you. Thank you. And now we have a brief break for 15 minutes. And then please 
Make yourselves comfortable, stretch, and relieve yourself in any way necessary. Take a breath of fresh air, and please join us again in 15 minutes for our next segment on the theory and practice of helping veterans with PTSD and moral injury. Thank you very much. Bless you.